Okay, can you hear well? No. Can you hold me? Ah. Okay, so welcome and uh, please have a seat. Tonight is my pleasure to introduce Professor Joseph Ellerstein from UC Berkeley. Uh, Joe Ellerstein you know, became famous for his work on data centric system and you know also the impact that this work had on the more general computing okay this work has been widely recognized is an ACM fellow also a fellow of the Sloan um, uh, f uh, organization also he received not one but three best paper awards from uh, well it's not right let me backtrack that it's, uh, with this test of time award, so you know, retrospective paper which were uh, recognized as fundamental three, he received three from ACM Sigma, right? Which is quite remarkable. Moreover, a recent review by um, MIT uh, technology review uh, lists his uh, work on CALM as the, among the most significant ten. Uh, contribution which is likely to uh, change the world, change our world, okay? So definitely uh, he is, has an impact or is expected to have an impact. As you may have noticed, uh, this lecture is dedicated to uh, Norman Friedman, who also is present in this room. And uh, basically, uh, Dr. Friedman got his PhD from uh, UCLA Engineering and then went on to occupy a number of important positions with the <coughs> government and industry. In particular, he was chair of the Cor Dura Corporation and the DAISY uh, Corporation. But in terms of UCLA, he was a very generous donor, okay? And he made many contributions, including he donated the um, Friedman Chair in Knowledge and Science, which I um, you know, have the privilege of occupying. Okay? So without further ado, let's give uh, Professor Ellestein and Dr. Friedman a warm hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Thanks to Dr. Friedman, and uh, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Is the sound okay? Nope. Uh, <laughs> so many knobs. Uh, how's that? Is that good? All right, super. Huh? Hmm? Thanks again for having me. Thanks to Dr. Friedman. It's an honor to be here. I'm really very pleased. Uh, and I'm delighted that the University of California, Los Angeles is in California. It's so conveniently located. So it's, it's, uh, it's been a great day. Lots of interesting conversations. I'm going to talk today about some work we've been doing in my group over the last uh, four or five years. Um, all the work I do is collaborative and it's joint work and much of the credit uh, goes to other folks. Uh, my graduate students, Peter, Peter, Neil, and Bill, uh, some of whom have been here before and if I uh, repeat things you've heard from them, uh, my apologies, that's all we got. And then uh, David Meyer from Portland State has actually been involved in this work all along the way and been uh, uh, a major contributor. So today I'll talk a bit about some motivation for this work and try to get you folks excited about the topic. I think it's a very important topic, actually. Um, I'll talk to you about some theoretical results we have that we think point in a positive direction uh, in contrast to some of the uh, impossibility results in the field that are more cited. And then I'll talk to you about a programming language we've been designing called Bloom that we've been using. Uh, it's a programming language for disorderly programming. OK, so programming today. Um, as uh, I'm sure you can imagine, most interesting software that's being built today, most non-trivial software, is big uh, distributed systems. All right? And uh, most programs, if you were to start a company today, you would very likely start one that involved some uh, scalable back-end processing and possibly some front-end in a web browser or, or a, a handheld device. This is just the kind of software people build now, is distributed software. And uh, it, it's really hard to build distributed software, right? It's got all the problems of software engineering multiplied by the problems of distribution, which is to say it's parallel programming. Uh, you have asynchronous messaging uh, for performance, and, and you have the likelihood of failure of components. All right? And so it's a real software engineering imperative in the industry today to make this easier. It's very hard. It's very expensive. It's very prevalent. 
right? And the problems uh, of distributed computing take us all the way back to the foundations of the field. Uh, this gentleman, John von Neumann, is accredited with the, the von Neumann architecture, right? Which looks sort of like this. It's a very orderly computing model in which you have a list of instructions and a program counter that steps through those instructions. You have an array of memory that's ordered. And then you have state that you're mutating, so the memory and the registers, in time, right? So that state is being mutated in, in an ordered fashion in the sense that things happen in order in time. And uh, this all made great sense when uh, I used to go with my mom to the punch card room as a kid because when she would submit her deck of cards, they would be submitted to the machine and they would run all by themselves in a sequential fashion. And we've been trying to preserve this programming model, this abstraction of programming, through generations of languages since then. Most of the languages that people use today are trying to preserve the illusion of a deck of cards being fed into a mainframe which for most of you is like before you're born. So it's a little crazy that that's our illusion. So you know, certainly languages like C, Java, Python, and Ruby, and even functional languages uh, like Haskell and Erlang that focus on lists, all right, are languages that are fundamentally about order and, and about order as, as a, a key piece of the, the language. So when you think about programming in, say, a cloud computing environment in a distributed environment, what are the features you hope for? Well, you hope that your code will be hosted in the cloud for availability, and you'd like your services to be replicated for redundancy so that if a component fails, another component can pick up where that one left off. All right? You want to be able to handle data that's bigger than the amount of data you can fit in a single node, and so you want your data to be partitioned across nodes and scaled out. And then to get real performance out of these systems, you don't want to have things that are moving in lockstep. You want asynchronous messaging to be happening. Messages are flying all around in the background. And so this is what's happening today in big systems like you know, Google and Yahoo and LinkedIn and, and Facebook. All this is being done, and for the most part, it's being written in Java which is insane because uh, it's basically punch cards up in the cloud, okay? You're taking a sequential orderly programming model and you're trying to use it for this disorderly world of cloud computing where you have all this uh, uncertainty about ordering of messages and the, the success or failure of those messages arriving. So let's look at a little baby example. What could go wrong? I mean, really, what could go wrong? You write a Java program, you run it up at Amazon EC2, you, you scatter it across 20, 30, 100 nodes. It's gonna be fine, yeah? Well, let's look at some sort of the classic baby example of what could go wrong. And we're going to go shopping because that's what people like to do on the internet. Uh, shopping and other stuff, but mostly shopping. Uh, and so let's buy an apple. And what will happen back at our, our shopping store is we'll have a shopping cart, or in this case a bag because I couldn't find a cart in time for the talk. Um, and we're going to replicate what you do for availability, right? So we're going to have two copies of this shopping cart over at our service for fault tolerance. And so we'll take, keep track in two places of the fact that you bought an Apple. Oops, except one of your messages got uh, delayed in the network. Okay, so it hasn't quite arrived at one of the replicas yet. So one replica's got a count of one Apple. And uh, then you know what? You're gonna decide you don't wanna buy an Apple after all. And so you're gonna send a please delete Apple message. Both replicas get that message, but the second replica has no idea what you're talking about and just ignores it, okay? Now you buy some oranges, and that's very nice, and both replicas get the oranges, and you decide you want an apple after all, and that's good too. And then your message gets delivered to the second replica, and you have divergence across your replicas. This could be bad. Might not be, might get lucky, but this could be bad, yeah? So this is just a baby example of the kind of thing that could go wrong, and I'm sure anybody in the room could cook up seven ways to make this go right, all right? So it's not that this particular example is hard, it's just an example, okay? So what's the classical treatment? How do we usually think about solving this problem? Well, the usual treatment is let's have a model which is distributed state. We'll have like a distributed memory or a distributed database or a set of distributed registers and read-write operations on those registers. And our desire is that all the replicas of these registers will come to the same conclusion at the end of the computation. So this is often called eventual consistency. So after all is said and done, all the replicas will agree on the answer. And the typical classical mechanism for this is to achieve a linear order of the actions. Let's make sure that all the replicas execute the instructions in the same order, because that gives us what's called a single system image. It's as if we have a mainframe <coughs> floating in the cloud in which we're executing things in a particular order. Okay? And the way this is often achieved is using techniques like Paxos or two-phase commit, which are sort of complicated techniques with multiple rounds of messages across machines to achieve an agreement on the order. So without getting into the detail of Paxos, here's kind of what we're trying to do. We're going to have a distributed clock of some kind, like Paxos, and we're going to make sure that all these nodes operate in lockstep with respect to this clock. So the apple will come down, and the clock will tick, and once the clock is done ticking, which is to say that both of those nodes have talked to each other and agreed that time has passed, then we'll register that an apple has been purchased, and they'll both do that first. 
And then the second thing they'll do is agree that the clock has ticked again and that they got this message. So they both in the same order will say, aha, we have no apples. All right, and then we'll do the same thing with this apple and the same thing with the orange and we'll get the right answer because they all executed the same instructions in the same order. Right? Okay, so you can use mechanisms like Paxos to achieve correctness by enforcing the correct order amongst operations that need to be ordered. Okay, so go talk to the developers who build these systems. This is not that hard, we'll just use Paxos, all will be well. Well, you ask them questions when they write their Java code they're gonna launch on EC2, say to them, uh, do you have multiple you know, computational agents, threads, processes, machines that need to coordinate in your program? Yeah, probably I do. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, which lines of code in your program are the ones you need to coordinate? Are you going to do Paxos on every single line of your program? That sounds crazy and expensive. No, I would never do that. Oh, so where does the Paxos go in your program? Here, over there, you know, maybe, I don't know, I think line 47 needs some Paxos. I'm not sure. All right, it's hard. It's hard to figure out how to get that right. And then, you know, you start to vary the deployment of the code. You say, you know what, not only are you going to have to run that program, but I want multiple people requesting things at the same time in different instances of the program. So we're going to have lots of concurrent requests, which are not the same requests, they're different requests, that will touch some of the same data, like the inventory of apples and oranges. There'll be multiple programs contending for these same resources. That's harder. All right. Oh, and we do want it replicated for fault tolerance, don't forget. And by the way, you know what? The state of the system won't even fit on one node. It's going to be partitioned across multiple nodes. So it has to be both replicated and partitioned and concurrent. All right, now, does it work? Maybe. It seems to work. Are you sure? Well, compiled. Does the compiler <laughs> prove to you that it worked? Oh, no. You know, the compilers don't do that. Well, maybe, maybe very fancy UCLA compilers sometimes do that. But for the most part, compilers don't do that. Okay, so, um, you know, meanwhile, by the way, don't forget the network sometimes drops things and the agents sometimes, blow, you know, blow up or run the garbage collector and slow down for a long time, etc. So there's a real problem uh, just to write the code, but hopefully you have somebody really awesome who knows how to write this stuff because you paid them a gazillion dollars. Uh, you, you become engineers and move to Silicon Valley, you will be welcome. <laughs> All right, the problem is after you work at the company for three years, you wrote this awesome code, you've made now millions of dollars, you will retire and someone will inherit your code. And then all that subtlety that you put in there to put the Paxos in all the right places will be correct until somebody changes something in the system and has to figure it all out over again. And they didn't even write the code the first time. All right, so from a software testing and maintenance perspective, this is just really fraught with danger. It's really, really a problem. All right, on top of this, if, if I haven't depressed you enough already, my good colleague Eric Brewer has this uh, negative result that everybody talks about for distributed systems, which is what is often called the CAP theorem. Uh, and the way that uh, Gilbert and Lynch kind of framed it for proving it is to say, it's impossible in an asynchronous network to implement a single read-write data object that guarantees simultaneously the following properties. Consistency of the outcome, availability of the system under failure of a component, and uh, tolerance of partitions where components can't talk to each other. You can't have all three of those things at once. And so sort of the theme of a lot of work in internet sort of scale systems is to say, let's give up on consistency so that I can be available in, in the event that nodes go down or the network is partitioned. So we won't have consistency. So you know what? Sometimes shopping will be wrong. Sorry. Right? And sometimes your program will, will completely lose its mind and there'll be two completely different views of what the system state is. And you'll just have to figure that out later. All right. So people are sort of programming without guardrails in this context because the CAP theorem has caused them to give up on consistency. So that's kind of uh, uh, what you hear about a lot in Silicon Valley when you talk to internet companies. Now in practice, you also hear from places like Microsoft in particular, and sometimes from certain places in Google, partition doesn't happen that often. Okay? And you can constrain it like if you stay on a single rack uh, or maybe if you stay in a single data center, partition's pretty unlikely a lot of the time. So maybe you, you should use consistency. Maybe it's okay. And the question is, what's the cost of using it? All right, so it's, it's available to us as a resource. We can have that global clock when we need it. How much does it cost to go coordinate on that global clock? All right, and you know, the answer is a lot for obvious reasons. If you have a whole bunch of nodes and they have to globally coordinate to agree that the clock should tick, that means everybody's communicating with everybody. Right? Everybody's really waiting for every good idea, regardless of what communication topology you set up. You can set up a service in the middle to be a kind of broker for this task, but it's still, everybody has to wait for everybody, okay? And so the weights for a graph in some sense is n squared. 
So my favorite discussion of this comes from a, a summary of a conference called Lattice a couple years ago. And the conference uh, summary was written by academics, by Berman and Chalkler, but they were summarizing comments from their industrial keynote speakers. And my favorite quote is this one. It comes from James Hamilton, who built a bunch of IBM DB2, built a bunch of systems at Microsoft, and is now famous as a data center expert at Amazon. And James, and he also looks like a rock star from the 70s, which is kind of fun. James says this. The first principle of successful scalability is to batter the consistency mechanisms down to a minimum, move them off the critical path, hide them in a rarely visited corner of the system, and then make it as hard as possible for application developers to get permission to use them. Okay, so that's wisdom from Amazon and similar quotes from eBay where they talk about how feedback loops from the queues behind waiting for these things can cause unpredicted failures across many systems. So they just try really hard to get people to not coordinate. Yes, it's possible. Please don't do it. All right, please don't coordinate. Or if you coordinate, keep it down to just a few nodes that are localized. And the obvious reason for this is you're on the wrong side of probability. So we've been in computing, you know, getting a lot of bang for the buck out of probability in the last decade. But in this case, you know, when you have consensus, what you're doing is you're waiting for the slowest guy. So if you have a distribution of latency times, right, and it's spread across some probability distribution, if it's high variance, somebody's going to be really fast. But unfortunately, if you have to wait for everybody, Somebody's going to be really slow, right? And so you're going to be gated by that very high probability that somebody's in the bottom of the distribution. That stinks. So probability actually hurts us rather than helps us. Kind of a bummer. All right, so what do people do? Well, they don't just wring their hands and not build computer systems, right? They go off and they build Twitter and Facebook, and sometimes they give wrong answers and stuff. But a lot of times they give right answers, and it's because good software engineers have kind of rules of thumb for how to work around this. First rule of thumb, mutable state is bad, or at least mutable distributed state is bad. It's what's known as an anti-pattern. It's the kind of thing you should avoid as a programming pattern. Okay, so try not to have shared objects that you want to change. If you have shared objects, they should be right ones, never mutating. All right, and the way you achieve that is to have instead a positive pattern, which is sort of a log shipping pattern. Take action at your machine, and then share what you did with the world. Just tell them what you did. Don't try to say that a certain variable has a certain value. Just say, I updated a thing locally, and that's what I did. All right, so let's take an example of that for shopping. Instead of having those registers that count the number of apples and oranges, we'll just remember uh, that guy bought an apple. Now, his message is delayed on the other node. That's fine. And that guy deleted an apple. And that guy bought an orange. And he deleted, oh, and he bought another apple. Oh, by the way, he bought an apple. All right. And then only after you accumulate all of these requests, which were just being added and added and added to a log, then both sides can tick the clock, say, I think we'd like to check out. No, everybody good to check out? Let's check out. All right, and then we'll tally, and we'll get the same answer. So here we only needed one round of coordination instead of one per action. And you know what? When you do uh, check out, you have to go through the billing system, which belongs to Visa anyway, and you're very likely to have delays, so maybe it's OK. All right. So uh, this is better. And actually, we can talk separately about how, in fact, you do this without any rounds of coordination. But I don't know if we'll have time. So we'll see later in the slides uh, actually how to do that. So, but this is the general idea of this kind of log shipping approach. Okay? So instead of doing destructive updates, you do this kind of uh, accumulate stuff and share it. Okay? So that sounds like a good idea. It's sort of a design pattern we'd like to harvest. But looking at it as a computer scientist, I'd like to ask some questions about What's the power of this thing? So when can I pull this trick off? If you give me an arbitrary, crazy uh, thing you want to implement on your website, should I spend time trying to figure out a log shipping implementation of it? Or is it impossible? Right? So when is this pattern possible and, and obviously correct? And when it's not possible, then you know, how much Paxos should I use, so to speak? Right? How much coordination do I really need? So those are interesting theoretical questions. And then from a practical point of view, just give me a language that answers the questions for me, like in the compiler, please. Because I don't want to have to prove a theorem about this every time I write a program. I'd like a language that, it, that, that sort of forces me to write things in this model. So where the language kind of puts me in the right frame of mind to utter sentences that are accumulative. Right? And then I'd like the compiler to enforce that, or at least check that I'm doing a good job and uh, find any bugs that I have with respect to these issues of order. All right, so the goal and roughly the theme of the work, and I can't claim that we started the work with this idea, but it's a good idea to follow on, is you talk to software engineers, you, you see design patterns that they, they promote, you try to get down to the nub of what is it they're really trying to do and formalize that. And once you have it formalized, then you can crank out machinery, right? you can crank out uh, compilers and checkers and things to take advantage of that pattern. 
And so that's kind of what ended up happening in, in our project. Instead of thinking about this as cloud programming, uh, and this is a bias because we're database people by, by training, we think of it as data programming because you know what? I know how to do all that stuff for data. I know how to host it in the cloud. I know how to replicate it and keep the replicas consistent. I know how to partition it for scale out. Teradata did that in like 1980. Um, I know how to do it uh, asynchronously for performance. I know how to do all that for relational queries and data. All right. So I'm going to give you a language that's much more like a data language than it is like a threaded programming language because data is disorderly. You get big bags of data and you slosh them around the network and you do MapReduce or SQL or whatever you want. I want to do that but I want to do it for all my code. So all the state of my program is going to be like that. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what we've been thinking about. This is an ongoing agenda that, that actually my group's been working on since the early part of the 2000s. We started in kind of networking and crawlers. Um, and so it's the work of people like Boon Tao Lu and then uh, Tyson Condi, who's now here on the faculty in the, the you know, much cited P2 system that he was involved in building. So it's kind of networking and systems. So there's a kind of declarative networking phase of my group, which uh, it's been reasonably influential. We also started looking at things like distributed Bayesian inference. So how can you get a, a mass of sensors to do Bayesian algorithms and reason about what's going on? Um, and then more recently, in kind of the purple below, we've been looking at distributed systems problems, like consensus and commit. We rebuilt the Hadoop file system in a language very much like the one I'm going to show you today. And we're able to uh, do some pretty impressive things with it in very small amounts of code. We've been looking at key value stores, communication protocols, and all these sorts of things. And twice now, Peter Alvaro, my student, and I have been teaching undergrads about distributed systems through this lens of data and the programming language I'm going to show you. And we're able to get undergraduates to implement fairly complex distributed protocols and algorithms, bring in their homework, it fits on a single screen, and they talk it over with their fellow students, debug it, and, and figure out what's right and what's wrong. Because the, the language turns out to be very compact and very clean for solving these sorts of problems. Okay, so the outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, what we're going to call the calm theorem, um, which is going to give us a counterweight to the cap theorem, which was a negative result. We're going to look at some positive results, all right? And I'm using positive here as a bit of a pun because the, the crux of all this is going to be monotonicity, things that accumulate and grow over time, okay? And so just to give you kind of a, a feel for it, code that's monotonic accumulates information, okay? Uh, and this is coming from logic programming. So the mo in, a, in, a, in a monotonic logic program, the more facts you learn, the more things you know, then you know more stuff. So if I tell you a new thing, you go, oh, I, that's interesting too. And you just keep accumulating things. Um, and so in traditional languages that you might be familiar with, like MapReduce or SQL, this would be things like map functions or filters or joins, where as you add more inputs, you just get more outputs. Right? Non-monotonic code causes you to revise your belief about what you used to think. If you learn something new, it might cause you to change your mind. All right? So new inputs can change your mind. That means you need to seal your input. If you want to truly believe something in a non-monotonic world, you have to stop listening. Right? <laughs> if if you, your mind could change with new information and you want to truly state your belief, you have to stop listening. You have to seal the inputs. All right, so and examples of this in these traditional languages are things like reduce or SQL aggregation or, you know, the classical one in logic programming, the negation of a predicate, which we'll talk about in a minute, and state update. So mutation of state, the, the core thing in von Neumann programming is non-monotonic, okay, and that's bad. So we'll keep talking about that. Okay, so let's talk about ceiling and time and space. So in order to do non-monotonicity, as I was talking about, you have to seal the world. And I want to focus on sets, because sets are nice and clean, or really logic languages. If you're going to say there is no little x in big X such that a property of that holds, well, you better be sure you know all the contents of little x. This is equivalent to saying, of course, that for all the x in big X, not p of x, right? For all. Well, you better know what all is when you're going to say for all. So you have to stop adding things to big X to make a determination about this, right? So you have to seal the world. What is time? Time is a mechanism for sealing fate, all right? Why do we bother with time in computing? We don't need time at all if we're just going to keep accumulating stuff and it's continuing to be truer and truer and truer. The reason we need to set aside two moments in time is because we need to decide what's true now and then be able to move on to the next moment. So let me, let me take you through that for a second. But there's this lovely quote, um, which is often attributed to a famous physicist. Time is what keeps everything from happening at once. It actually comes from a science fiction writer, right? Uh, back in uh, apparently the 20s. Um, this is going to be very apropos. I'll show you exactly what this means. Time is what keeps happening. It keeps everything from happening at once. All right. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But time is a mechanism to seal fate. Space 
is just multiple perceptions of time. It's just many <coughs> clocks. It doesn't really matter that you're over there and I'm over here. What matters is if we can't tell what time it is for each other. So in two computers, right, you can't really know how far the other computer may have gone since the last time you heard from it. You don't know what it's thought about time is. And that forces you to keep asking each other, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? And you're always behind. You never know truly what the other person thinks. There's no true common knowledge. You have to engage in protocol and waiting to get common knowledge. So what space really is, is it's the idea that you can't be sure what time it is somewhere else. And coordination is the ceiling of time and space. It's agreement amongst a set of nodes, a set of clocks, as to what the time is, or really what, whether it's time to tick the clock forward. Right? And that's what a coordination protocol is going to achieve. It's a, a distributed clock protocol. I often get this response when I say stuff like that. What the hell am I talking about? So let me give you some intuition. All right. And let's look at sets again. So suppose I gave you a language that was only relations or sets of, of structured objects. All right. How would you talk about state change? How would you talk about a von Neumann style thing if, if your language was sets? Right? And uh, we puzzled over this, and it turns out we reinvented some things that Bertram Ludischer and others had done in the mid-90s. Um, uh, and then we extended it with asynchrony and some other distributed features in a language called Daedalus that Peter Alvaro developed. But what we're going to do is we're going to take our sets, and then for, for every object in our set, we're going to give it a timestamp. So if you want, you can think of this as a relational table, and we'll make sure that it has an extra column called timestamp. Right? And we'll have facts in this table, like Joe is wearing a black shirt at time one. Right? And that's a fact. It's a moment in time. It's just a true thing. Okay? And then suppose you wanted to persist facts. You wanted to have store them. Okay? How would you do that? You'd do it via induction. You'd say, if Joe is wearing a black shirt at time one, then he is wearing a black shirt at time two, and so on. And that's what it means to persist the fact. I will remember this over time. Okay? Very nice. Okay, um, so, and by the way, this is, this is not an abstraction. This is how the world works, right? A, a very persistent student is one who comes to office hours every time. Right? The English word persistent actually means tries over and over. And of course, DRAM, if you think about it, works by cycling a current through memory. Right? You have to keep persisting the value uh, in order to, to keep it true. It's, it's quite physical in computers sometimes how persistence is implemented by induction. Okay? So how do we do mutation? What is mutation? We do mutation via negation. We're going to say, look, at time t, if I'm wearing a black shirt, and I say I would like to remove my black shirt, then at time t plus 1, I don't have a black shirt anymore. But if at time t I say I'm wearing a black shirt and I say nothing about removing it, then by induction in the next step I'm wearing a black shirt. Okay? So we're going to do that induction unless we say to stop induction, indu inducting, inducting. That's not a word. Right? Everybody understand what we're saying here though, right? You have, to, you have to interrupt the induction, you have to break the current. And if nobody's asked to break the current, then it's still true. And you'll see, well, in a minute, right? So, by the way, we might actually want to not just delete things, we might want to uh, put in new things, and so we can also say, look, how do you change your shirt? At time t, you say, I would like to wear a white shirt, and I would like to stop wearing a black shirt, and then at time t plus one, I'm wearing a white shirt. No? Yeah? Okay. And the thing to notice here is, is negation, all right? This is that thing you have to wait for. How do we know all the requests to remove shirts? Well, we have to stop listening to requests to remove shirts. We have to say, the clock has ticked, and anybody who wants to take off their shirt, that, your opportunity is now gone. You'll have to wait till the next time step. And this is what I mean by uh, time being the thing that keeps everything from happening at once. If it weren't for time, I'd be wearing all the shirts at the same time, right? Which might be uncomfortable, but for things that can only have one value, it also wouldn't make any sense, right? A variable can't have two val values at once. How do you separate the values of the variable? You separate them in time. That's what time is for. Okay? And in, in, in a logic, it becomes very clear that, that it's not meaningful to assign two values to a variable. It has no valid interpretation. The sentence is meaningless in logic unless you introduce something like time. And so the Daedalus language is, is really a logic language like Datalog, which is something that Professor Zaniolo has worked on for many years, um, in time and space. And, um, you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but the first rule is just a traditional data log rule. It says, if x is true at time t in q, then x is true at time t in p. And that's a traditional kind of thing, and it's, it's now. It's the same time in the antecedent and the consequent. On the right-hand side, time is t. On the left-hand side, time is t. So that's something being true about q. It's true about p right now. So you can say things like that in Daedalus, but you can also say inductive things, like if x is true at time t in q, 
and u is the successor time to t, it's the next time, well, let's be able to say a rule that x is true at time u, which is the time right after t. I'd like to be able to write rules that talk about what happens in a single time step. And then the last bit, which is the thing that really pulls from uh, Carlo's work, is to say, we also want to talk about what happens when you send a message over the network. I don't know when you're going to get it. I know it's going to be at some time, but it's going to be chosen by some random oracle in the physical world. Okay? And so I'm going to have to have some logical construct to talk about randomness, which conveniently work at UCLA addressed many years ago. And it's kind of fun how they do uh, randomness, actually. It's like, the thing that got chosen is the thing that's not in the set of things that didn't get chosen. You say, what? It's really fun, actually. The paper's great. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, you're, you're able to say, look, I want to have something at time t and q, and pick me some time z when it's going to arrive at p at random, and then it'll be at p at time z. And there's a much nicer syntax for it, which looks like this where you say, look, you can say p of q, you can say p at the next time step of q, and you can say p at some time in the future of q. Okay? And so that's a lot easier to read. So this is kind of the foundational logic, and we're able to take this logic and then, and then prove lots of nice data log theorems about it that will underpin uh, the work we're going to talk about today. So a question, you know, just to finish up, when do we need time? Well, time is what seals fate and prevents paradox. So then the real question is, when do we not have paradoxes? When can we collapse time? And we'd like to answer that question in a language of sets. And then maybe we'll talk about how we answer this question in other kinds of languages that are not just about sets and logic. All right? But let's start in sets and logic, because there's a rich literature we can build on that I happened to already know a little bit about when I started the work. And it turns out to be well suited to the problem. So the CALM theorem, CALM is an acronym. It stands for consistency as logical monotonicity. The idea that monotonicity of the program logic is what gives you consistency without any coordination. Right? And so this was a, a, a conjecture, a hypothesis I had that I shared with the database theory community in a talk at Pods 09. Um, and my theory was, you know, look, I think that code that's monotonic, that genuinely grows over time, that never forces me to revise my beliefs, that kind of code's just going to be eventually consistent. Once everybody gets all the information, everybody will agree on the same thing. We don't need to coordinate about clocks. We, don't need to, we just need to know that everybody got all the same messages, and then everybody will agree on the program outcomes. So it's in a kind of accumulative computing, and it's disorderly. It doesn't matter what order the messages come in. And that suits distributed computing nicely. Uh, another word for this is, is used in the literature a lot is confluence. No matter what path or what order these messages take, uh, you get the same outcome regardless of order. It's a theoretical way to talk about this log shipping pattern we saw from programmers. All right, and the other part of the conjecture was the inverse, which is to say, look, if your program is somehow inherently non-monotonic, it, it wants to revise a fact somehow. And in the original paper, I cast this in terms of data log, which is a little weak because you can, you can enrich this. But if for some reason there's no way to say your program without a non-monotonic property in it, then you're going to have to seal to avoid the paradox that that non-monotonicity captures, right? It's going to try to say uh, p and not p at the same time, and, and you can't do that, so you're going to have to somehow introduce uh, global time, which is coordination. All right, so that was the conjecture, and what happened uh, over the course of the next couple years is various people took my sloppy-ass conjecture, pardon my language, and uh, tried to put some bones around it and build a real theory. Um, so very simple result from a beat bull, which is kind of the easiest piece of it. In, in an operational model of programming known as transducers, all right, so you actually have a notion of computation and a way that things get computed. So it's not really declarative. It's not a how. It's, a, it's, it, it's not a what. It's a how. It's a kind of, if you program under this certain abstract machine, you can prove that monotonic programs will give you consistent outcomes without coordination. So a bull did that much, and that much kind of was, was easy. Amelut and Vandenbusch uh, did, did more. So they did a bidirectional proof of this. And the paper is quite interesting and, and, and a little bit complicated because you have to define what consistency means. You have to define what coordination means. And to do this without uh, letting people cheat and f spoiling the uh, theorem is tricky. I won't get into it today, but they were able to come up with a, a bidirectional proof or, or statement of the of the conjecture that was provable. And then most recently, Daniel Zinn and, other, uh, and his advisors at UC Davis actually pointed out some subtleties where um, if you know about the placement of data in the network, so if you can actually have the nodes realize that, say, they have all of the things in, in big X, then they can autonomously, without coordination, know that they can do uh, non-monotonic things to X, because they know everything about X. They have the world sealed by definition. And so 
without a lot of detail, he, he was able to extend into a larger class of programs with three-valued logic the notion of coordination-free programs. So he was able to actually get more coordination-free programs under a slightly richer computing model than the previous guys. All right? But the, all those proofs worked on, on a, a, a model of a computer called a transducer that really was operational. You had to believe that the transducer is a good model of computation. Now, if you're a real logic person, which I, I, I can't really claim to be, but I'd like to play one on TV, um, you try to prove things without any model of computation. You try to say truly what can be said in a program and what would its outcome be or what would it mean to answer the question that the program posed. And that's a truly declarative way of thinking about computation, all right? So you state uh, a formulation of your program as logic and you say, look, for a given set of inputs, is there only one consistent output or is there only a small family of, of, of reasonable consistent outputs, all right? And so that's the approach we took in my group, was try to come up with a model theoretic proof of the calm conjecture. And we got it only really in one direction, which is the easy direction. Monotonicity implies consistency. But we did do something that I really wanted to do, which was also important, which is to say, look, if you have non-monotonicity in your program, and you can check this in the syntax, is there a not sign, right? All you need to do is protect that not sign with a global clock tick, and then you will get a consistent outcome. Okay, so what we're able to show is non-monotonicity plus coordination, guarded by coordination, guarded non-monotonicity, yes, that will give you the right answer. You know, a consistent answer across all nodes. Okay, so that's just a flavor of some of the things we looked at in, in the COM theorem, and I'm not going to get into proof techniques here because, uh, first of all, I can't keep them in my head and remember them. We'd have to sit down and look at the paper, and second of all, they're kind of boring. So the downside, particularly the model theory stuff, is you're just pushing symbols around. Logic, I don't know if you've ever taken a graduate logic course, but you're just rewriting things. It's incredibly boring. So uh, I, won't, I will spare you the grief. Okay. Um, but what I will tell you is another uh, corollary of the Kron conjecture, which is also a conjecture, although Amelut and Vandenbusch have a paper on this as well that's under submission, which I call the Kron conjecture. And Kron is an acronym for consistent, I'm sorry, causality is required only for non-monotonicity. All right, so here's the idea. Lamport famously, so Leslie Lamport, uh, one of the fathers of distributed computing, has a famous paper, it's sort of the seminal paper in distributed computing on time clocks and the order of events in a distributed system. And he talks about a notion of causality, meaning if something happens before something else on your machine and you send a message to me, then I heard about it after the things before the time you sent the message, right? So if you did step one, step two, and then sent me a message, I know that that message came after your step one. Right? I may not know what you did in the interim while the message was in flight, but I know that there were things from before you sent the message that the message came after. Right, so this gives you a partial order, not a total order, but a partial order on the events in the system called the happens before relation. We know which things happened before which things for some pairs of things and for others we don't. And it's a transitive relation, obviously. If I know this happened before that and this happened before that, then I know that this happened before that. Okay, so the causal order is a sensible partial order. The problem is, you know, I had to go read these papers because I got interested in distributed systems, and they're hard, and I'm lazy. And so I asked the question, why am I reading this? Do I really need to understand this Lamport stuff? Maybe I can just ignore it. So I said differently, like, you know, thank you very much, but when can I ignore this, this causality business? All right, and my conjecture was that I don't need causality if I have monotonic programs because they can happen in any order. I don't care what happened before what in the real world. It doesn't matter to me. I can do it in a different order. I get the same answer. So maybe this, this Lamport stuff, you know, I really don't need it, All right? So you say stuff like this to people and they look at you like you're crazy. You say, look, you know, it doesn't matter what order things happen, right? And they say, well, come on, that doesn't make any sense. So the classic version of this not making sense are time travel paradoxes, right? So the classic one being the grandfather paradox. So the way I like to describe this, you have to imagine it's like the twilight zone, right? And there's a very young William Shatner he goes back in time, okay? He finds himself back in time. And as he gets out of his time machine, he, there's a little ruffian in front of him with a knife. And he gets into a fight with this little boy. And, and they tussle. And eventually, he grabs the knife, and he accidentally kills the child. And he feels very distraught. And he feels even more distraught when he finds out that the child was his own grandfather. Okay, because what does that mean? Well, it means that he could never have been born. But if he was never born, then he never went back in time. So he didn't kill his grandfather, which means that he was born. But then if he was born, he went back in time and he killed his grandfather. Ah, what is true? What is false? Who does he exist or not? It's right. And all this really amounts to is like Shatner and not Shatner. 
<laughs> you know, it's like that was the concept for that, that episode, Shatner and not Shatner, which doesn't make any sense, right? So obviously that doesn't make any sense. But the point is not Shatner, right? Murder is non-monotonic, <laughs> okay? <laughs> However, there's a different version of this episode in which William Shatner goes back in time, and this was a Star Trek episode, and he falls in love with a beautiful young woman in the past. Right? The rest of this is not a Star Trek episode. He falls in love with a beautiful young woman in the past, uh, and, and, and they fall in love, and they have children, and then he discovers it was his grandmother. All right? Now, that may be uncomfortable, but, from, but it's purely monotonic, which means that there's no difference between him having babies with his grandmother in the past and him having babies with his grandmother in the present. You get the same number of babies. Right? So time is only there to deal with non-monotonicity, so, and causality similarly, then. You don't care the order of events if things are truly monotonic. Why am I telling you this? This is ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. It's really useful for things like replaying logs. So suppose you have a distributed system, and you'd like to make sure that, that you can replay what happened in case of failure or for debugging or for other purposes. Do you have to log the order of events across all these nodes in the distributed system? Not if it's monotonic. Okay, you can replay the messages in any old order. You just gotta keep a log at each node of which messages arrived. You don't have to keep the interleaving of those messages, which is gonna be tricky. And of course, we use that in our log shipping model, right? This is the whole point, was to be able to say the logs can be replayed in any old order. So it's really valuable to not have to worry about causality when you can get away with it. All right, final uh, sort of corollary to the Cron conjecture that I posited at the time was that this is the right way to think about parallel <laughs> complexity. When you ask me how hard is an algorithm in a distributed system, my answer to you will be, well, how many rounds of coordination does it take? Because that's the only thing that costs anything anymore. Computers are free, right? They, they go infinitely fast. Um, storage is free. Uh, there's, there's as much storage as you could possibly want. The only thing that matters is waiting. So how many rounds of waiting do you have to do? If you like MapReduce, how many reduce phases are there? Could you get the whole thing into one map phase? Could you get your program all into one map phase? Or do you have to go through multiple reduce phases? And I will point out that MapReduce is a terrible programming model because it doesn't, it, you can, <laughs> there's monotonic things you'd like to do that require communication and MapReduce only lets you communicate with a barrier. You can't communicate in MapReduce without a barrier. All right, so that's all wrong. So ignore the MapReduce thing. But um, what can you say in monotonic programming? You know, and, and a version of this also, suppose I gave you a language like Daedalus but took away the not sign. I said, here's your programming language, you can never delete anything, have fun. You'd say, that's a ridiculous programming language. How can I have a programming language where I can never change anything and I can never delete anything? That's ridiculous. What could I possibly say in such a limited language? Well, that's a question for a theoretician, right? What could I possibly say in such a language? And the answer is, you can say all of polynomial time, and it's been well known since the 80s, right? And if you want to do exponential things in a distributed system, you're nuts. So arguably, from at least a complexity perspective, you shouldn't need coordination at all for any reasonable computation. Now, the constructive proofs like in the Immerman paper are not useful. So it's not clear to me that this is actually constructive. I would not give you a language without uh, uh, non-monotonic operators in it. But you can go a long way, and you should try when you're programming. This goes back right to James Hamilton. You should try very hard to think of a clever way to write your program without coordinating because there's probably a way to do it. All right, and so it's worth thinking about. And so here's a real question then from a complexity theory perspective. This got picked up by people like Dan Susu up at uh, Washington. Can we talk about uh, algorithm complexity by the number of coordination rounds? And he went ahead and he characterized, uh, he, he built a, a model of, of parallelism called the massively parallel model, the MP model, and then showed which queries could be uh, achieved in a single round of coordination. All right, so it's kind of nice that that, that uh, sort of conjecture got picked up and formalized as well. And so this is one of the models of parallel computing that people like to use now for sort of MapReduce style or massively parallel style computing. All right, we're breezing through this talk much faster than I expected and I deleted all kinds of things, which is a damn shame. But all right, here we go. So the next part of the talk, I wanna actually present to you a language that will encourage you to program in this style. It's a language called Bloom. And Bloom is a disorderly language of data, space, and distributed time based on Daedalus. So if you didn't get Daedalus, that's okay, because we're going to redo it now in a nicer uh, uh, syntax. Bloom is, again, like Daedalus, it's a declarative language. So you always are saying what you want the outcomes to be. You're never saying how to compute it. But most people don't like to think that way. And there is a perfectly natural sort of event loop way to think about what Bloom is saying. And so I'm going to teach you the operational model that actually I implemented when I implemented the, the first Bloom interpreter. Um, 
And this is a perfectly reasonable way to think about your Bloom programs, because it corresponds to the way we think about computers. So we're going to have individual computers or individual nodes. Each one of them has its own clock, can't see each other's clocks, because that's distribution. Each one of them is going to have its own state or its own data. Okay? Can't see other people's data, because that's a lie. If you think you can see someone else's data, you're actually seeing a remembrance of their data past. right? Anybody who promises you global memory is lying to you, or they're coordinating a lot. Okay. One of the goals of this work was to fix stuff we got wrong in older languages. And in the older languages, we had global state. We had all these crazy bugs, and we couldn't make sense of it. It was because we were lying to ourselves. Okay. So you can only see your own state. And then at each node, we'll operate in sort of an event loop, one step at a time. And here's how a time step works, works at a Bloom node. You can get three kinds of inputs at the beginning of the time step that were delivered to you uh, uh, at that time. One is updates from the previous tick that you, you made yourself. All right, this is that next trick that we did uh, in Daedalus. Right? You may want to tell yourself that something should happen at the very next time tick. So at the very next time tick, you'll get that stuff. So you have these local updates. You may get system events like you know, someone pressed the key on the keyboard or, or uh, something like that, all right? that just kind of come out of Nowheresville. Uh, or you might get messages over the network from another participating Bloom node. Okay. Take all that stuff and incorporate it into your view of all the true things in the world. So it's new data. Right? You just add that to your sort of database of, of state. And then you're going to take a bunch of rules and you're going to apply them atomically without doing any more of this listening to the network or system events or other that stuff. You're going to do a fixed point computation, which is to say you'll run these rules until you can't deduce anything new. Right? And those rules may feed back on themselves now, in those kind of now Daedalus rules. Right? If I know P now, I know Q now. Right? And so you keep doing that until you don't know anything new. Then your time tick is almost done. You'll generate things for the future if somebody asks for them to be done in next. And you'll put things out on the network for the unknown distant future for things that were supposed to go out on the network. Okay? And the syntax is really very simple. Rules in Bloom are object merge expression, and they're read right to left. So an expression will have a value that you will merge into an object. And you can think of the objects for the moment as just collection types, like sets. All right? So we have a bunch of built-in object classes. There's more, and it's extensible, but we'll start with these. We have persistent collections, which we'll call tables. And you can think about them like relational database tables. They don't have to be flat tuples. They can be arbitrary objects. But, but they're like you know, database tables in the sense that they have a, a, a persistence, and maybe they have an identifier or a key. You can also have scratch tables, which are transient. So they're only true. The stuff that's in them is only remembered during the tick, and at the end of the tick, it forgets. Okay, and those are useful kind of uh, just for kind of notational convenience. They're almost like macros, right? You can also have these things called channels. Channels are like, uh, they're transient, so they're like scratches. But when they're on the right-hand side of the rule, you're reading from them like uh, uh, scratch. So they're a temporary fact that you know in the right-hand side of the rule. When you see them on the left-hand side of the rule, they're distant states. So they're places you're going to send the data to. Okay, so you can use them to read from and to write to. But the writing to part is asynchronous, and it's going to go land somewhere else later. Okay, so channels are really like network read and network write. And then, you know, look, if you want to have system events like clocks and stuff, you can tell the system there's going to be a table. It's of type periodic. Make sure to populate it every second or minute or whatever with stuff. And you can tell what kind of stuff you want to go in there. All right, so those are our four kinds of, of key objects. Merge functions correspond uh, to them, but merge functions deal with the time stuff from Daedalus. So you can merge now, which is this less than equal operator. That means stuff the things in the expression into the, the, the collection now. You can merge at next. So make sure at the very next time tick that this thing is merged in. You can merge asynchronously, which is what you use for channels. Say the stuff on the right-hand side is going to be merged in remotely sometime in the future on the left-hand side. Right? And then you can also do deletion, because I like non-monotonicity. It's kind of handy. Okay? So you can delete things. Deletion always happens at the next time tick. So you can say, all the stuff that's on the right-hand side, make sure it's not in the left-hand side at the next tick. Okay? And then on the right-hand side, you can have expressions that generate stuff. And when I implemented this uh, the first time, and my students liked it enough that we're still working with my implementation, which they've grown a lot, but it's, it's still the same code base. It, we implemented it in Ruby. So the stuff you get on the right-hand side is stuff you can say in Ruby that generates collections. And I should point out this is uh, stuff that's uh, uh, 
kind of functional. There's, you, can't, you can't generate uh, or mutate things on this right-hand side. It's just things that, that generates collections, OK? So you can do maps and flat maps and reduces and groups and arguments. You can do these kind of all pairs of things in collection R and collection S, which is like a relational join, right? Uh, you can check for the emptiness and, and, and the, the contents of collections and so on. And that's most of the language right there. So let's look at an example. Here's a complete program in Bloom. It implements a, a hosted chat server. All right, so clients can connect to this thing, and when the clients uh, want to sign up to be in the chat, they can do that. When they want to send a message for everybody to see, they can, they can send that message, and the chat server will propagate the messages to all the participants. So the program is extremely simple, uh, and this is the whole thing. So with a little bit of Ruby wrapper to tell it, hey, Ruby, this is a piece of code, we're going to have a block that declares the state of the program. It has a persistent table, which is the list of addresses of nodes in the chat, and a channel on which we're going to multicast messages, and a channel on which people are going to request to connect to the system. And there's only two statements in this program. The first says, if stuff comes in on the connect channel, take the payload, which is all the attributes except for the address attribute, and at this time tick, include that address in the node list instantly. Right? If it's already there, it's set semantic, so it's still there. If it isn't there from before, it's now added. So that's how people, that's how you deal with connect requests, right? And in the client code, of course, there'd be a rule with connect on the left-hand side somewhere, okay? And then the other thing that the server has to do is to say, look, if in the current time tick there's stuff on the multicast channel, then for every message on the multicast channel and for every node in the node list, all pairs of messages and nodes generate an object that has the address of the node and the value of the message and stick it into this channel meaning take that message and send it to all the nodes for all messages. All messages go to all nodes. All pairs of messages and nodes form a new message, right? And so we've just turned multicast into relational join because they're the same thing. And we've turned network communication into queries because network channels are just the same thing as tables. They're just kind of funny because they have weird time semantics, right? They, they transit things from one clock world to another clock world asynchronously. All right, so we've managed to write an entire chat server in, in roughly two statements. Well, in exactly two statements with some declarations. All right, kind of cool, and it works. And moreover, we can feed this program to an analysis, which will generate for us some facts about the program and draw us a little <laughs> data flow picture. So this is what, we, what I like to call an Alvaro diagram, because Peter Alvaro write, wrote the, the tool called Budplot that gives you this. And what this is showing you is the circles are transients. So there's a transient called connect, which is a channel. The squares are persistence, so the node list is a persistent collection. And the arrows are dependencies in data flow. So if something's on the right-hand side of a rule, it points to the thing on the left-hand side of a rule. So connect points to node list. Connect feeds the node list. And mcast is fed by both the node list and by mcast. Right? And solid lines are local and instantaneous. Dotted lines are asynchronous and remote. Right? And so that just describes the flow of data through this program. Now, let's go back to shopping at Amazon. The goal with all this was to be able to help the programmer who wanted to consider these two implementations that we saw before, the mutable state implementation and the log shipping implementation, to get some help right, from the programming language. So remember, in this destructive version of the shopping cart, we had a mutable state thing, and in Amazon is triply replicated, not doubly replicated. Each update was coordinated. The clock ticked for every purchase request, and checkout was coordinated, all right? And in the disorderly cart, the cart is triply replicated. There are these log updates that are propagated lazily, right? It doesn't matter what order they arrive. And the checkout tally is coordinated in this implementation. And I'll point out that th I'm taking this directly from the Amazon Dynamo paper, which is a much cited paper in distributed systems describing the key value store that Amazon uses, which has given birth to the NoSQL movement, okay? So all these NoSQL databases you hear about are based on this paper, pretty much. The thing is, this paper actually, the NoSQL part's not that interesting. The interesting part is how they got the shopping carts to be coordination-free, <laughs> which is this part. So actually, there's an application trick, which is this programming pattern of log shipping in this paper about key value stores. All right, and so that's the part we're capturing here. So we're going to do automatic analysis of the program. We're going to get that data flow analysis that you saw in, in the Alvaro diagram. We're going to do syntax checks for, for deletion and other kinds of negation. So anything that amounts to non-monotonicity, we'll check just from syntax. And we're going to combine the combination of data flow and non-monotonicity to answer the following question. Is there anywhere in the program where you have asynchrony, so messages could be reordered, 
flowing into non-monotonicity, flowing to an operator that depends on order. If you have random order flowing into something that depends on order, you have yourself a problem, okay? Because different replicas will non-deterministically choose different answers, okay? And so that's a race condition that you need to worry about. And so these Alvaro diagrams are just gonna pull this out. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on the syntax of this Bloom program other than to, you'll see it small, okay? So this is a working implementation of a key value store and then shopping carts on top of that key value store. So here's the interface to the key value store. It takes puts, deletes, and gets as inputs, and it produces responses to the gets as outputs, right? And interface here is a, is a special version of Scratch. So these are scratches that you can see in other modules, right? So they're scratches you can name outside the system. And the Alvaro diagram for this is stuff flows in from the top, from the source. It goes into either delete or get or input then something happens that you haven't programmed yet, so please fill in this box, okay? And this is what comes in the automatic output of this, this uh, analysis. And then it feeds somehow uh, the response, and that goes to the target. So that's the, the actual generated co uh, image from analyzing this fragment of code. So there's many key value stores you could implement. You could implement a causal key value store. You could implement a transactional key value store. You could implement just simply an eventually consistent key value store like Amazon did. In our class, we had the students do all these things, okay? It was a lot of fun, and each one of them was like a screen full of code. Here's the simplest one, which is just the eventually consistent key value store. I'm not gonna go through it a lot, but there's one rule to say, look, we're gonna have, sorry, de declaration, we're gonna have to keep locally at each node the state at that node. And this is a single, single node implementation. Replication just adds a couple lines. Puts change the local state. Gets look up stuff in the state and return it in responses. Deletes, delete things from the local state. That's it, all right? And I'm not gonna go through all the syntax, but it's really that simple. And when you stick this and the interface, which was included at the top, so this interface, right? Stick this program and the interface into bud plot, and you get this Alvaro diagram. Stuff flows in the top, it's either gets or deletes or puts. There's a bunch of non-monotonicity, which is the circles, the white circles on the edges. Um, there's no asynchrony, because this is a single node implementation of a key value store. Where is the uh, non-monotonicity? Well, there's one piece of it. There's a deletion, right? And that's reflected in the flow from KV del uh, and KV state to itself, right? Because KV state and KV del are on the right-hand side of a deletion rule, which is non-monotonic. And there's another non-monotonicity here in the uh, atomic mo compared to modification from when you want to put something and you overwrite what's in the state. All right, so those we just pulled out from the syntax. There's less than minus and less than plus minus, which is a less than plus and a less than minus. Um, and, and we just, you know, syntactically detect that in the program, all right? And we can generate that diagram. And the diagram's fine, all right? This is a single node key value store. Now let's go shopping. So this is the code to do the cart on top of the key value store, where requests come in off the network, right? And they're actions, and they might ask to merge things into the cart or take things away from the cart. I don't want to do the details on this, but the top block is shopping actions, the bottom block is checkouts, okay? And that's the whole program. And here's the Alvaro diagram, all right? It's got some colors in it now because things are problematic. We have dotted lines, which are asynchronous. We have non-monotonicity, those little circles, and it's bundled up all the non-monotonicity of the KV, of the key value store in that stop sign. And when you have <coughs> potential disorder in front of order-sensitive stuff, remember, you have a problem. And so that's what all the red business is. The flows beyond that red thing are out of control, all right? You don't know what's gonna happen. So we have asynchrony, feeding non-monotonicity, leading to potentially divergent results across replicas. That is bad. And so the way you fix it is you go to the red thing and you wrap it up in some coordination. You put some Paxos around that rule, okay? And it told us exactly where in the program we needed some coordination, all right? And there's different ways you can implement coordination, synchronous replication, Paxos, et cetera. The thing you should know about this, we know from this program that if there's n client actions and m checkouts, there's only going to be one checkout. We know that because we understand shopping. We can look at this thing and say, well, we're coordinating on every uh, client action, so that's going to be n rounds of coordination. Here's the disorderly cart. This is the log shipping implementation. Again, very small. I don't want to go through it. Here's the Alvaro diagram. Still asynchrony in front of non-monotonicity, leading to divergent results. So it's still bad. We still need some, some nice Paxos, all right? But what we know here, looking at the flow, is that what we're waiting for for this thing to trigger is the checkout message. And we'll only need one round of coordination now for this implementation of the program. So just by looking at the static analysis of the program, because it was written in this kind of mostly disorderly fashion, we can tell you where to put the ordering. 
And this is the exact opposite of programming in Java, right? If you program in C or Java or most languages like that, you write a line of code, you write a second line of code, you write a third line of code. Implicitly, you said do this, do this, and then do that. Order is, is implicit, and you, your compiler has to take it away. In this program, order was, uh, disor disorder was implicit, and then the compiler told you where to put the order. And in fact, in subsequent work, which I won't have time to talk about, we synthesize an efficient ordering protocol for you, so you don't even have to put in the order. Good? All right. That was nice. That was the base language of Bloom. But the problem is all our data structures are, are relations or sets. And people don't like to program like that. Like, for instance, how do I implement a clock? A clock is an integer that keeps getting bigger. I'd really like to have integers. That would be nice. Right? I don't really want to accumulate a set of all the integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and just keep them. I want to change the value, right? So. What we're going to do is we're going to extend the language with lattices, and this is going to help us. So what was so great about sets? Why were sets disorderly? Well, because they were insensitive to order. That is to say, union for set is commutative. They're insensitive to batching. So if I get 17 messages, I could process them all at once, or I could process just a few, right? So they're insensitive to batching. That is to say, union is associative. And they're insensitive to retry. So if I don't know if the message is received, I can keep sending it. So that is not a word, item potes, but it should be, I think. Um, so union commutes, associates, and it, it, it item potes, right? It, it, it tolerates multiple sends without uh, getting things wrong. And so um, savvy people who've been building distributed systems were writing papers about this a number of years ago and calling this pattern ACID 2.0. So ACID, of course, is transactions, which is a coordination model. This is a respin on the acronym. Associative, commutative, item potent, and distributed. If you can write programs like that, then you don't need to coordinate. All right. So where else can we apply this uh, this ACI idea other than sets? And the answer is anything that is a bounded join semi lattice, because that's what a bounded join semi lattice is. What's a bounded join semi lattice? It's a pair of a data type like S and an operator, uh, this funny little uh, V thing, such that S is a, s a set of things, objects of some type. Uh, and the funny operator is a binary operator we call least upper bound, all right? And least upper bound is associative, commutative, and idempotent. This is what the definition of a bounded joint semi lattice is. Something nice to know about bounded joint semi lattices is they induce a partial order on the elements of S. X in S is less than Y if the uh, least upper bound of X in Y is Y. Okay, so what really? How should I think about that? Think about it like an object class with a single method merge that grows over time. It's a monotonic object class. All right? It's a lot like a set. It's just an object class I don't really understand, because it's opaque, with an ACI merge method. So any Bloom rule that's object less than or equal to expression, or object less than plus expression, doesn't matter what the type of object is, as long as less than equals is associative, commutative, and idempotent. Right? So now we can have objects in Bloom that aren't just sets, that are anything that, that has this property. So let's look at some examples. We know sets with union uh, are, are a, 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 a lattice. But we also know that integers with max are a lattice, right? They satisfy the properties. And Booleans with or are a lattice, right? So these are all examples of things you might want in your program, like numbers and Booleans and, and uh, stuff, OK? So we can now have a, a larger class of, of, of data types. That's nice. So now we can have objects that are disorderly, OK? But what do we do about computation? Objects are just objects. Right? We need to put them together into programs with data flow in order to get computation. So how do we get disorderly computation? We need functions between these objects. And the functions need to be monotone if we want to preserve our monotonicity analysis. What is a monotone function? It's one where if you take the least upper bound before you take the function, f of a or b in the s domain, you get the same answer if you do the f in the a domain and then take, or f in the s domain and then take the or in the t domain. All right, that's a monotone function, again, just by definition. And let's look at our examples. So we have sets. If you take the count of the set, or the size of the set, that's monotone. As you put things in the set, the count of the set increases, right? All right? And threshold is another monotone function from sizes to Booleans. If it starts out, it's less than 3. Eventually, once it's greater than 3, if you just keep unioning stuff into that set, it will continue to be greater than 3. All right, so now you can start to see how you might string along programs together to do the kinds of stuff you want to do in distributed systems. Let things grow until stuff is true. Okay, like you might let things grow till they're done for some definition of done. Okay, and so BloomL is an extension of Bloom where you can add these lattice data types, and we added some pretty simple ones. So increasing integers, um, 
uh, booleans, uh, maps of lattices, so you can take a key value pairs of lattices, and that's a lattice too, so you can kind of compose these things. And when you add this, and monotone functions, and then of course non-monotone stuff as well. So again, just like less than minus, we'll let you do stuff that's non-monotonic if you want to. If you want to bump your counters downward and turn the speedometer backward, that's fine, but we're going to put coordination in your program before you're allowed to turn this, the, the, the odometer backward. Okay. All right, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on the language, but just to give you a sense that it's a good fit to distributed programming, the right-hand side is the Wikipedia description of vector clocks, which are kind of the classic Lamport distributed uh, uh, construct. And, and that's the right-hand side. And the left-hand side is Bloom. And there's almost a one-to-one, -one, the colors don't all work here, but there's an almost one-to-one -one correspondence of Bloom statements to uh, uh, statements in the description of, of uh, vector clocks in Wikipedia. And we see this a lot in the student's code, that the code's very compact, it's very readable, and it pretty much echoes the protocols that have been defined in the literature. So there's something kind of right about the language, and I don't know how else to convince you of this other than showing examples. Okay. so. Um, just a little bit more, just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things we do on top of Bloom. We have a number of tools and extensions to the language we've been working on. I won't go through them because there's really not enough time, but just to give some credit to my students. So Peter Alvaro, who's the guy with the sunglasses in the first couple of pictures, has a paper at uh, Data Engineering this year on uh, a tool called Blazes, which synthesizes the coordination. So it takes his diagrams, right, finds the red spots, and then it synthesizes code for the red spots that does the coordination efficiently. And oftentimes he can play a trick where he doesn't need to do Paxos. He can do something more clever than that because he knows that we're not coordinating everything. We're only coordinating, say, a particular shopper's session. Right? When, when Amazon Dynamo finishes shopping, it doesn't finish shopping for everybody in the world and do coordination over that. It only does it for one shopping cart at a time. And you can pull that, uh, that partitioning of the data out of the syntax of Bloom programs using functional dependencies, which is a database thing. And then you can trace through which values could determine which values. Not just which rules could determine which rules, but which actual values. You know, your cookie is associated with all the shopping for you and not associated with any of the shopping for me. And I can see that in the program syntactically. Right? And by doing that, I can play tricks like have the coordination happen at the web browser. So the web browser will actually send a summary of the shopping cart with the checkout message. And that's the coordination. Because at the client, you have a single node that knows all the shopping rules. And so you can automatically realize that in that case, coordination should happen at the client, which is to say the client's going to generate this little digest of all the messages you should receive. That digest will get sent to all the shopping replicas, and they will wait till they receive all those messages and then check out which means that there was no coordination at all. The coordination happened in a single place at the client. And he will automatically detect such cases and synthesize this efficient single node coordination. So it really makes a this is the place where you get coordination to go away entirely. Also, by the way, the trick in that Daniel Zinn uh, uh, theory paper. Uh, Peter also worked on generating tests for Bloom programs. So what the heck would you do with a Bloom program uh, to test it? Which is kind of an interesting question. And he uses... Uh, 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 some interesting techniques to do that and make it efficient. One other comment on Blazes really quickly is Peter was able to do this not just for Bloom, but for other languages that happen to be data flow languages. So he does it also for Twitter's Storm system, which is a, uh, a language for doing uh, data flow. He's able to do the same analysis with a little annotation help from the programmer. So the ideas from Bloom are starting to come out of the language and be applied to other programming models, which I think is really, really important. Uh, you know, you don't want to be in your walled garden forever, right? Okay, um, Neil Conway, the guy in the middle, has been working on something like we called Edelweiss because it's bloom that you can't delete from. So if you know the song from The Sound of Music, bloom and grow, bloom and grow, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's bloom where you don't have any deletion, which means you have to do garbage collection somehow. So this is literally just that monotonic programming stuff, if you like, but we have to make sure we, we collect state at some point. So you have to figure out what does it mean to do garbage collection in these languages. Uh, and then finally, my student, uh, Peter Bayless, who's a little bit more junior, but is, is just, uh, he's a machine, has been doing a whole bunch of things on uh, uh, using this stuff to uh, prove things that are tighter than just what's the eventual outcome. He'd like to also know what's going on while you're computing, and could that be okay? And then finally, can you take all this stuff and use it to make databases go faster? So can you turn off the lock manager in your database for a certain workload? And sure enough, for the, the classic TPCC benchmark, which is the benchmark to measure how well your lock manager goes, almost all the rules in it, you can turn off the lock manager. And so you can just go as fast as you want, essentially, without any locks, with a couple tricks. So he's been working on that. Okay, so I'm winding down. 
just some directions. These are things we're thinking about in the group um, and uh, uh, things that I'd like to see happen sort of one way or another. The first is that this calm work has not been translated to the world of lattices, all right? Because there isn't necessarily an obvious way to do model theory in that world uh, or transducers. But I think it can all be translated. But it, it hasn't been done. So actually, the blue metal stuff has not been proven to be correct. I'm pretty darn sure it is. Uh, these various calm proofs kind of need to, need to settle down. So we need to decide on what's the right interpretation of the calm theorem and kind of agree on it as a community, I think. Uh, and then finally, from the, from the complexity side of the theory, we tend to think about, like in the MapReduce model, that we have barriers across all the machines in the network. A more interesting version of this is, well, suppose you write computations where the, the coordination is among subsets of the nodes. Okay? That would make your risk of a node being a straggler, of a node being slow, smaller. Okay, so you might want to talk about on expectation for a particular program. If it only had a little bit of coordination amongst a few nodes, for whatever that might mean, um, could you say that it coordinates less than a program that has a barrier across all the nodes? Okay, so I think that, that needs to be kind of baked into the model of uh, these, these, these uh, co uh, complexity results. From a practice perspective, really, it, it, we need to go uh, do a next generation of the implementation of the language. So to make it much more efficient than my, uh, my Ruby implementation. And then I really want to turn all this stuff on its head and apply it to machine learning in a big way. And I know uh, folks like Tyson Condi and his colleagues at Microsoft have been doing related things uh, when they were at Yahoo anyway. Uh, and I think it's a big opportunity that these declarative languages are, are very ripe for doing big machine learning. All right, so those are things I want to work on. Uh, I need to find some students to work on it. Uh, and then finally, the lessons that we took from Bloom and Com, how do we take them into current practice? So I describe this mostly as a walled garden. But really, could you get most of this analysis power in libraries or in variants of familiar programming models? So let me give you an example. I'll give you Java. You can have it. But immutable objects. Okay, so once you set the value of an object, you can never change it. Or maybe versioned objects. Maybe you, you will keep all the versions of the objects, but we will never throw anything away. In such a language, could we prove most of the same things and give a more familiar programming model? All right. So that's just one example, though. I think there's a lot of ways to take the, the ideas of Bloom and not buy all of logic programming. Uh, and then similarly, you know, maybe somebody really smart could not even have that restriction, but just look at Java and figure all this calm stuff out. I don't know. Seems hard. So stepping back, uh, and actually, you know what? I think I'm going to do, well, all right, so I want to talk a little bit about software engineering now in the large. So Calm was a framework for us to think about distributed programming from disorderly first. All right, and Bloom was one example of where we can go with this that seems to me to be well suited to this domain of distributed systems. But, you know, kind of what should, what should we be thinking about working on next? And I actually had to give this talk yesterday at a software engineering conference. So I was, I was uh, trying to think about this in the context of really what matters in software engineering. Uh, and I've spent a bunch of time, you know, in the big data world with a variety of companies, including my new company, Trifacta, but also Greenplum, which was a very successful database company, and a number of less successful companies, as well as my days back in the Proscurus project. So I've seen a lot of sort of industrial and, and open source engineering. And there's this trend going on in, in development out there today, which is that agility today is trumping correctness. And you see this in terms of scripting languages that are, that are, not, uh, safe, that are not typed languages, right? You see this in uh, the CAP theorem and the way it's been treated. So people are saying, look, I can't get consistency, so let me just make sure the system's available, and who knows if it'll be correct, but by God, we'll, we'll bring up the system by next month. And just generally, the model of doing agile programming, and getting something working, even if it's a little broken, and then iterating over time. You know, one version of that is that's awesome because the code is always live, it's always being tested, and it's always improving. Another way to interpret it is it's always broken, a little bit, right? It's never really right. You just never stop and get it right. So I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but what I do think is that whenever you see a, a pattern like this, where people are sacrificing correctness in order to get agility, you should look at how they're getting around the problem of correctness, because they're probably getting the code to mostly work. And there should be some design there that you can pull out, right? So if you see this kind of model, then the design patterns that people are using to get things to mostly work are things we should try to codify and put back in so they can get the correctness back, right, without changing their practices. So that theme, I think, is a really important one for software engineering. Um, and that's one of the things that I've liked about sort of the Bloom journey we've been on. The other piece of the journey that is really important to me is this notion that all the state of a program is data. 
right? Whether it happens to be on the stack or the heap, which these are just abstractions, right? Let's not forget, it's all just silicon and current and stuff, right? So whether it's on the stack or the heap or it's in the database, it's all just data. And if you have a uniform representation of that data, then you can play games. You can partition the data. You can replicate the data. You can do anything you want. This data-centric view of programming is very powerful and very well suited to distributed systems. And I think there should be more languages that are data-centric, even if they're not logic languages. Uh, and then finally, of course, distribution or time has got to be a primary concern in computing. And it's not. And most compilers don't tell you anything about distribution correctness. They tell you all sorts of lovely things about moving things up and down the memory hierarchy and reordering operations without breaking things as long as they're sequential. They don't tell you anything about correctness typically in the distributed environment. They don't tell you about where to place your data and how to organize your data. They just don't answer the questions that distributed programmers ask. And it just seems like a shame because this is what everybody's implementing these days. So, you know, just to close, uh, I actually won't close. I'll just go to my final slide, which is if you'd like to read more about our work, it's up there at boom.cs. Uh, the language stuff is all at bloomlang.org. And um, I am currently spending all my time at Trifacta, and we're recruiting. So if you're looking for an interesting job in uh, software engineering in San Francisco, uh, let me know. Um, but you can try sending me an email, and I might actually respond. So feel free to try. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. I can't answer the question because I don't know the work, so I'm guilty of uh, ignorance. Um, guilty as charged. Um, you know, the roots I'm going to are Van Emden and Kowalski, which is also 70s, right? Which is that we should program with logic. Um, so there's lots of good ideas back there to pull from. That's the tradition I'm pulling from. If you ask me, you know, what was the big debate between Van Emden and Kowalski and Unity? I don't know. All right, but we could go figure it out, maybe. Right. Yeah. I think I'm confused over uh, the relationship between a Bloom program and this calm consistency thing. So you're saying this Bloom program is going to be consistent with another instance of the program? Or I don't understand really the motivation behind this need for lattices, right? Because I can have a single table and then I can flip a Boolean on every tick, right? If it's true, next time it's going to be false. And next time it's going to be true. That's a non-monotonic thing, but you can do it in Bloom, right? You can. I don't, I don't see really so the question was, um, you know, what does this notion of consistency have to do with the language Bloom and, and particularly with lattices? And, and part of the question was, look, it seemed to me that you said that you could go from a Boolean being false to true and false again in the language, right? So what, what is this consistency? And I guess what I'm trying to say is, if we can prove that your program syntax is all monotonic, so you have only monotone functions between sets and counts and thresholds, all right, then we know that at all nodes in the system, if ever that variable goes from 0 to 1, it will stay there because it's monotonic. And so we can do this monotonicity analysis across data types and across functions. If the program is indeed monotone, then the Calm theorem says it's eventually consistent. All the nodes will agree on the outcome. Okay? If you can't, if the program has non-monotonicity in it, we will flag it, as in those alpha row diagrams, and wrap it up in uh, coordination. And the key is that it's all static analysis, right? It's all static analysis in the current implementation. That's right. Yeah. yeah so it's just coming straight out of the syntax. Yeah. Um, so Bloom is currently implemented in Ruby. What are the issues in putting it in other languages? And have you tried that? Ah, so the question, uh, Bloom's currently in Ruby. Uh, have you tried putting it in other languages? And, and, and what would be the issues? Um, I don't think there's anything fundamentally difficult about uh, uh, implementing it in another language. The way it's implemented, there's essentially a, a, a asynchronous query processor underneath that implements data log semi-naive evaluation, which if you like, you can think of as MapReduce without barriers and with iterations, okay? Or you can think about it as relational queries with iteration. Um, you could implement that in whatever. Um, and one option for implementing it actually is to put a relational <coughs> database in the center of that loop. You know, you put SQLite or MySQL or something to just run those queries in the middle, translate from Bloom to SQL queries and some control logic. Um, 
I would like to do these things. Uh, we just haven't had time. Yeah. But, but, but in general, you did put like a data, so basically a data, a data, you could build a data, data log engine on top of a SQL, if I'm right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's very little logic, because all you have to do is to do the fixed plan. Ah. So the question was, did I just say that you could build data log on top of SQL and it would be easy? Uh, and the answer is, well, kind of. You can build in inefficient data log on top of SQL and it'd be easy. You have to do a bunch of language rewriting to make it efficient. Uh, and you also have to be a little careful how you stage data. You don't want to go sucking the data out and putting it back in and sucking it out and putting it in. So you have to be a little bit smart about it. But it's, it's actually it seems pretty reasonably doable. Yep. And to some extent, that's sort of what Tyson did in, in the P2 system. Yeah. Well, you know, you talk about the monotonicity, and of course, monotonicity within a lattice, and, but of course, you show well, max, but sometimes you don't mean. Uh, so what do you do? Is that responsibility of the programmer to tell the lattice ah. is monotonic or not? So, yeah, so the question being, you know, how, how do you register with the system that there's a lattice and it has monotonicity? There's a programming <laughs> interface to add lattice types with merge functions, like in any object language, right? You'd have a, an object class and a method. Okay, so, so you can have object right. classes, and you, right now, assert the monotonicity, you assert the associativity, commutativity, <laughs> and item potence of the merge operator. If you're wrong, the analysis will be wrong. Um, we've looked actually into, could you prove that arbitrary Ruby code is associative community of an item potent, and that looked hard, so we gave up. So that's the responsibility base of the program. Right? It's the responsibility, but it's a very, very small, level, very small level. trusted code base, right? Things like, like integers being monotonic when you take their maxes is code you could inspect and pretty much convince yourself is associative community of an item potent. So we've been trying to keep that trusted code base small. Yeah? In other um, domain of distributed programming, it's often a case that your program evolves over time on different modes. So how much um, Bloom can help in that kind of model? I see. Uh, so the question was, if you, I in many cases, was the assertion, uh, programs evolve over time, that is to say the code changes yeah, over code time, changes. Uh, on different nodes, and, and how can Bloom help? So. It, it, Bloom does not assume single, impro single uh, uh, instruction multiple data. It doesn't assume the programs at every node are the same by any means. And the, the program analysis can be done across the, you know, the unity of all, not the word, you shouldn't use that word, the union of all the code, okay? Um, if you change code at one node, you'd have to rerun the analysis. Um, uh, so in a, in a like truly uh, federated model where you didn't know the code at every node, uh, then you'd have a problem, so to speak. Some of the work on Blazes just asks for annotations on boxes of code. So it'll just ask, you know, is it an order sensitive piece of code, yes or no? And that's all you would have to let us know. All right, so some of the work on Blazes tries to pop up a level and say, look, I can't analyze the code, but all I need are a few properties, like order and sensitivity. Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's thank again. Thanks for having me. Thanks for Comment, you know, in the